Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to our legacy lunching series. We're delighted to have so many of you join us. Sorry, we're a couple minutes late as we wanted to ensure that others could log on, log in. I'm Stan Kelly and I'm the chair of the Wake Forest University Center for Private Business. And it's my pleasure to kind of kick this session off this afternoon. I want to first say we've got attendees and members from across the state of North Carolina from multiple different industries. And it's such a credit to Tim uh, that so many people would take their lunch hour uh, amidst all the um, challenges and demands that you have on your time to be with us. So uh, this is a, a great opportunity for all of us and um, you won't be disappointed. Uh, so we'll look forward to getting Tim introduced in just a couple of minutes. Let me start by uh, saying that um, I have a, a announcement that I don't want to mention, and uh, you're the first to learn of this. Uh, we will be announcing the new executive director of the Center for Private Business. Her name is Katie Disler, and we're so pleased to have her joining our team. Katie brings to the center more than 20 years of experience um, in the nonprofit and philanthropic space. She found her way to Winston-Salem some 10 years ago after being the executive director at the uh, Turner uh, Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, over the last several years, she's run her own business, so she will have great experience in the challenges and opportunities of running her own business, running your business, and so she can certainly relate to you. You know, along with welcoming Katie, I want to also just on the front of this program, just give a big shout out and thanks to our other team members, um, Lily, Sarah, Brooke, and Jack, who've helped us, continue to help us as we have uh, made this transition. So we're delighted to share that news with you. We'll be uh, updating and coming out with uh, written materials, et cetera, uh, in the days and weeks ahead. So anyway, welcome, Katie, and I'm sure the team and the members will look forward to meeting uh, you as well. A couple of housekeeping. Um, first of all, let me say that um, along the way here, if you have questions that you want to submit, please feel free to do so. And of course, we encourage you to do so. There is a, a comment box that's part of the live stream. And so we'll log your questions and get them to Tim uh, as appropriate. I do want to note that this program is being report recorded. So just be aware of that. So let's get on with business. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker and I couldn't be more pleased to do so. And our moderator will be uh, Reagan Fullen, who I'll also have the chance to introduce here in just a minute. So this is a, a neat opportunity for us. Tim O'Shaughnessy. Um, Tim was named the president and CEO of Graham Holdings back in 2015. He joined Graham Holdings in 2014 to oversee investments and acquisitions to help set a new direction for the company following the sale of the company to uh, the sale of the Washington Post company to um, uh, Kaplan. Previously, he served as chief executive officer of Living Social, which he co-founded in 2007. During his tenure there, the e-commerce and marketing company grew sales to $2 billion. Tim is a native of Minnesota and the youngest of four children. Um, Tim was born in 81, following his graduation from Georgetown in 2004, where he got a BSBA in marketing, operations, and information management. He joined AOL. He was a product manager there. Then in 2006, he moved to Revolution Health, where he rose to vice president of product development. During that time, and um, he had a successful series of development to include applications uh, that are used on uh, Facebook. That company grew into Living Social, which um, you heard me mention previously. So uh, Tim uh, is with us from Washington, D.C. He's actually, he said, less than a mile from the White House. So plenty going on there, as you can well imagine. So Tim is married to Laura Graham O'Shaughnessy, and they have three children. And um, I asked him, uh, tell me something that uh, that you do when you're not working. He said when he was in college, he uh, formed his own business. So he's been an entrepreneur for um, many, many years. He formed a handyman business, and he has to dodge requests frequently from his wife around his house to do handyman things these this day and time. So we're delighted to have Tim 
join us, and I know you'll um, be delighted to hear his story. And I'm equally pleased to uh, introduce um, to some of you our moderator, Reagan Follin. Many of you, of course, know Reagan. Um, any of you who have, you know, wonderful volunteers who give of their time and their experience, Reagan is that person for the Center for Private Business, along with Drew Hancock, Todd Johnson, a number of other people. But she's uh, a rock star in my mind. She's on our advisory board. Reagan was the president of and CEO of Old Salem Museum and Gardens uh, for the last five years. Um, she stepped down from that a couple of years ago. And uh, but prior to that, Reagan had a long career in the technology industry, working for Lotus, um, of course, an IBM subsidiary. So she brings wealth of knowledge from so many different places for us and really spent a lot of her time in sales and marketing. So it is my great pleasure and um, fortune to have a chance to introduce Reagan and Tim. Reagan, I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thank you, Stan. Yeah. That was so nice. Hello, Tim. Hello. Thank you for having me. Well, I sure wish we could do this in person, but we're going to just make this uh, as much fun as we can virtually. And I want to echo what Stan said. Thank you to everybody that has logged in um, to have this conversation with us. And so, Tim, I'm going to I thought um, I'm going to reiterate what Stan said to everybody on the phone uh, on the phone. Yeah, on the line. Um, if you have a question, put it in the comments field. I promise you we are allocating a block of time at the end. So Tim can answer your specific questions. In the meantime, we're going to make him answer some of mine. But I thought that we would start with just some introduction. Now, Stan did a really good job of kind of giving us your bio. So maybe the one thing you could at least sort of talk to us about is how did how what were the circumstances surrounding you kind of moving from founding Living Social and developing that into such a successful company to being asked to lead Graham Holdings? Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a good question and an interesting story. Uh, uh, I, um, you know, I, I started a company with a few other uh, folks called Living Social, which grew into this large e-commerce kind of technology uh, uh, business. It, it was started about 14, 15 years ago. Um, and it, um, you know, it was really all about consumer technology. Uh, and that company grew and we actually did a transaction where a bunch of the early shareholders uh, were, were bought out uh, and it was kind of a transition point for the business and I thought it was a nice, you know, it wasn't something I envisioned myself doing forever and ever and so I thought it was a nice transition point for me as well. Um, and I, um, I had always, uh, for a very long time, had been um, really thinking deeply about investing in companies. Like I love just learning about companies, and I love reading, you know, ten Qs and that sort of thing. And I had thought that's what I would go and do was be an individual investor. Um, and uh, uh, you know, around the same point in time, uh, Don Graham, who was the CEO of the company, uh, which was then the Washington Post company, also my father-in-law. Uh, when he was asking, well, what are you, what are you going to do next? Um, I started to realize he had an ulterior motive there. Uh, <laughs> I, I had told him, well, look, I, I've actually been kind of managing some investments, you know, with a real interest, and that's what I plan on doing. Um, and I'd, I'd had a reasonable track record and, and some success, both with operating the Living Social and, and some investments. And he, he started to talk to me about, well, if that's what you want to do, wouldn't you want to do it in a with an already existing platform and in infrastructure and businesses that are generating cash flow and everything? Um, and so I started, you know, I never had really entertained it. Uh, uh, you know, I had been on a, in a business track and career um, even before I, I met my wife. And so it was not ever kind of part of where I thought I would be. Um, but he, you know, he presented some pretty compelling arguments and, and I, at the end of the day thought, well, if I can do what I want to do, but I actually can help, you know, my family along with that, that that's a pretty good thing and a pretty unique opportunity. So, so that's ultimately, you know, how I, how I made the leap and, and transitioned and took over for Don. Well, that's, that's interesting. And thank you for sharing that with all of us. I think for the people that are um, dialed in, it might be helpful if you give us a little bit of the history of the company and how it's evolved, um, because I think it's very different today than it was in its early kind of form. So could oh. you kind of talk us through a little of that? 
Absolutely, it is very different. Uh, uh, the, the company has been around for 87 years at this point in time. And uh, the first 80 of those years, it was known as the Washington Post Company. Um, and in 2013, shortly before I joined, uh, Don made the decision uh, to sell the newspaper to, to Jeff Bezos. Uh, and that was a uh, hard decision uh, because it was it was the name on the door. It was the emotional soul of the family, uh, even if it was not uh, the economic powerhouse of the company anymore. It was still, you know, this real emotional piece. Um, and so uh, the business in, you know, starting in 1933, um, the first generation of this family uh, business, uh, a, a gentleman by the name of Eugene Meyer, uh, who would be my great grandfather in law, um, uh, he bought the Washington Post uh, uh, on the steps of a courthouse in a bankruptcy auction. Um, and he played, I believe it was $825,000 in 1933 dollars for, for the paper. Um, and interestingly, he had made an offer of $5 million a few years earlier to the owner who didn't want to sell. So by waiting a few years, he got a much better deal. Um, but the Washington Post was not an attractive business or newspaper at that point. Um, Washington, D.C. was a uh, five newspaper town in the 1930s. Wow. Uh, and the Washington Post had the fourth highest circulation. Uh, so, so it was really a, a laggard. Um, and it was a lousy business. Uh, it lost money. Uh, and not only that, it ended up losing money for uh, about 20 years until it actually turned a profit. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, Eugene Meyer believed very strongly in the ability to... Um, uh, build a competitive and strong news product, and that would lead to increased advertising and circulation. And every year he saw improvements. And he ultimately expanded that into additional uh, media businesses. So television stations, uh, we used to own Newsweek. Uh, we had a cable system. Um, and so for a very long time, the first you know probably 50 years, the company was almost exclusively media properties. Um, in the 80s, uh, um, Don and his mother, Catherine Graham, uh, decided to start to diversify outside of media, uh, and they bought a company called Kaplan um, from Stanley Kaplan, the founder of, of the business, who it was in, I believe, his 80s at that point in time. Um, and Kaplan was a little business that was doing about $40 million a year in revenue. Uh, and that, you know, they were able to grow that into a real, you know, uh, strong billion dollar uh, uh, top line business. Um, and then over time, the, the business continued to mildly diversify. Um, now in, uh, and I, I promise I'm, I'm almost done with this long winded answer, but years in, in, uh, in a minute or two is, is, is tough. So uh, in 2013, um, you know, really that was, you know, in the in the 2000s, the uh, uh, media business was changing drastically. We've all seen this in 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 our own lives, and for a company that was heavily reliant on media, um, you know that was an existential risk. Uh, and so Don made a series of very challenging decisions and hard decisions around putting the company in and the media properties in the best hands they could to be successful and really be good stewards for for the company. So. Um, uh, you know, that ultimately culminated with, with, with the sale of the Washington Post and, uh, and you know, a name change that, that went along with that. Uh, but really, it, it sort of freed the company to start to think about what does it want to be for the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years? Mm -hmm. um, because it didn't, no longer had this, this uh, legacy piece that was a key driving force. Um, and so uh, there was loss that was felt associated with that, um, but there was also opportunity felt associated with that. And so the company at this point in time has built up um, a segment of manufacturing businesses um, and has really evolved into something that looks a little bit more, um, I would not say it is this, but has some aspects of a Berkshire Hathaway type of model um, and, and a little bit more of almost a publicly created family office type of model. Yeah. Well, this is the perfect lead in because I was going to ask you as a as as kind of an extension of that, how do you decide like where you want to compete, what to acquire, 
Like, how would you describe your competitive advantage? And can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So, look, it's not a uh, uh, it's not a nonprofit. It's not a a, a you know uh, an a, an organization that its sole purpose is to just think about uh, uh, anything other than profit. So we definitely think about that. Yeah. Um, but the uh, and. and we are, and I should note, um, you know, the company's named Graham Holdings. It's the Graham family. Um, we, it is a controlled company, uh, but the, but the family, even though it's publicly traded, is the largest economic block as well. So they're, um, you know, those, those things kind of go hand in hand. And you know, we 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 think that the ability uh, to be family run and and owned and controlled allows you to think about things in different ways. And and one of those things is I'm the I'm the third CEO of the company since 1963, and you know you can probably tell from here that I'm I'm hoping I have a reasonable tenure ahead of me yet. Retirement is not on the uh, on the on the near term horizon here. So when you have that level of stability, you think about the things where I'm making decisions today, and I'm sure many of the people in the audience here think about it where. I'm going to live with those decisions 10, 20 years from now. Uh, and it's, it's not somebody else that's going to come in. It's going to be me. Uh, and so that, that, that gives you, that really hits home a little. Um, and so that, so the areas we really like to compete in are areas where we think that being a company or in a sector, if you're owned by us, that is actually a competitive advantage. Um, there are certain segments. I think media is one of them. Education is another. Uh, you know, we've actually built up a, a healthcare business uh, over the last few years as well, and that's a third. Where I actually think the world is better served by uh, an ownership structure where people view things, um, view part of what they're doing as stewards and a stewardship model, uh, in addition to an income model. And you know, you have to have the second, otherwise the first won't work. Um, but but I think in a world where we're making long term bets on sectors and industries and with partners, they want to know who who is going to be an owner of a business five years from now or ten years from now. They want to know that there's a common shared you know alignment around ethics and morality, and that you know the ownership is going to be stable where that's going to exist for a long time. So we really do think um, there is a competitive advantage. In, in certain segments being owned by a company or, or, or ownership uh, uh, being by a company like ours. Um, and, and I think that's not everything we do, but it, it, it is an area that we continually say, hey, how can we use our family structure and our, our stewardship approach to be a competitive advantage in, in certain industries? That's super helpful. I, I, I'm interested in, um, you know, you're a publicly traded company, you brought this up, but the family has a kind of a the largest block of ownership. So talk to us a little bit about governance. Yeah. So what does that look like in this scenario for you all? Yeah. So we were a dual class stock structure. Uh, and mainly you hear about those these days in some of the big technology companies, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world. Uh, where they really, where they originated, uh, tended to be in media businesses because uh, you wanted the ability to protect the editorial independence uh, uh, from, um, you know, shareholders that may not necessarily uh, share the same view of what editorial independence should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we we still have, you know, large media properties today, and and that, you know, that still matters. Um, uh, as that governance goes, um, the, there are the A shares, which are um, the family uh, held shares, uh, have the ability to appoint a certain number of directors to the board of directors. Um, so there is that aspect of governance. Um, but you know, the other thing I, I think is important, and it, and, it, and it matters an awful lot to me, is that the, the economic, it's not one of those circumstances where uh, the governance far outweighs the economic, you know, importance to to a, a family structure. I mean, the the economic uh, uh, block, the number of shares that the family hold are, are are the largest in the company as well. So those things, I think, go pretty hand in hand. 
I um, I happen to know that you had a pretty um, famous um, board member that was a board member for a very long time, and um, and you mentioned Berkshire Hathaway, so I think the group might just be interested in that. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, it. it um we, Reagan, we were uh, uh, and still are in many ways one of the luckiest you know, companies in the world. Uh, Warren Buffett uh, bought shares uh, in the Washington Post shortly after it went public in the early 70s. Uh, and he became one of the largest shareholders. And it's this great story because he wasn't really known then. Uh, you know, if, if you look up, uh, uh, the, if you go to the Wall Street Journal and you look back at any issues of the Wall Street Journal from when he bought shares in the Post, I think he was only referenced once or twice at that point in time in very kind of offhand matters. And so suddenly this person comes in and buys, I think it was 11% of the company in the, uh -huh. in the open market. Wow. And Catherine Graham had just taken the company public, you know, a year or two prior in the midst of, of the, the, uh, Pentagon Papers. Uh, it was really the same week that she took that public was when all those lawsuits and Richard Nixon, um, you know, threatening to pull TV licenses and all, and it's a whole different story. But, um, uh, you know, and and so suddenly this person comes in who she doesn't know and, and goes and buys 11% of the company. And all of her advisors were saying, no, oh, you gotta, you know, be very, uh, standoffish and what have you. You don't know who this person is. And she said, well, why don't I just go and meet with them? And she met with them and she came back and she said, that might be the smartest person I've ever met in my life. Okay. And uh, uh, she actually invited him to join the board and he joined the board and he had a very small period of time in the eighties where he had to step off of the board due to some holdings Berkshire Hathaway had. Uh, but he was, other than a very short interruption, he was on the board of the company for 37 years. Yeah. And the uh, when he turned 80, he uh, uh, he stepped off the board. Um, and you know the company is really uh, so thankful uh, and and so much of why it was able to navigate things uh, well over the last decades has, has been because of of, of Warren. And, you know, I joined just after he stepped off, but I've gotten to know him a little bit. And, um, you know, he's been a, a friend of the family and the company for, for decades. And it really, you know, how much he cares about the, the company really has come through. Um, and I'll, I'll give one, one last anecdote on that front. Yeah. Um, we as a company uh, have a, a pension plan for our employees. Um, and, you know, we have this defined benefit pension plan. And you know that, that's increasingly rare to, to be seen in the world. You know, most of the world has switched to four hundred one k's. And uh, you know, one thing that Warren did for our company was in the seventies. He really had this viewpoint that most companies, and frankly, most municipalities as well, didn't really realize the compounding effect of the liabilities they were accruing in pensions. And he thought that how people were managing the investment side was not, uh, uh, you know, appropriate based on the liabilities they were accruing. So he went to us and he basically told us how to we should be managing the investments in our pension plan. And as a result, we haven't had to contribute. We have a very generous pension plan and we haven't had to contribute money to it for people's retirement since the early 80s. Wow. And it's now um, over a billion dollars overfunded. Uh, and so the, you know, there's advice and things that you get. And then there's really practical things where his, you know, guidance and counsels really funded very generous retirements for, you know, tens of thousands of people that have worked at the company over the years. Wow. Not everybody gets the benefit of that kind of, you know, knowledge and expertise. Oh my gosh. And that's, he's made a really meaningful difference in the life of your company and for your employees as they retire. You, uh, yeah. I just, I just wish I, I, you know, I, 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 I wish age was, was something that never happened. I'd love to have another 37 years. Yeah, seriously. That's, thank you for sharing that. I, I'm interested in leading. Um, when you think about leading this business, does it manifest itself a little bit differently or require a different approach given that you're leading effectively a family business? 
Um, and how do you marry the leading the family business, but it's also a publicly held company, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, it, it, it's a great question. And the answer is feels like on any given day or month or year, it might, might be different. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but at, at, at the end of the day, I, I think, um, you know, you really want to make sure that you keep all of your stakeholders informed with what you're doing, whether that's your public shareholders, whether that's family members. And communication is important on that, on that front. Um, I, so, so I think that is, is kind of point number one, is just making sure that you have good open communication explaining what you do and why you do things. I mean, the, the, the second piece is, you know, I, I think the, the, the family and the business here, um, you know, we're in the fourth gener generation. The, the company's been public for, you know, coming up on 50 years. They get that you can't control the stock price on any given day, month, year even. And so that, that it's just the good mentality of are we setting ourselves up for you know the next 10 years are going to be a good next 10 years and and because there's that alignment um that's that's really helpful so uh having you know kind of your investors whether they're your family members or external investors really understand and be aligned in time horizon um is is important and then the last thing i would add on that is I believe I really believe the adage that that you get the shareholders you deserve, and uh, you know on the family front, um, I, I think that's almost embedded within what we do. Uh, uh, but on the the public shareholder front, I think what we have found over the decades, and I, and I think you know there was a little bit of turnover in our shareholder group uh, right around the time of the post, but since then. What we've really found is that the shareholders we're attracting look an awful lot in their thinking like our family members. So uh, the amount of turnover of our stock is much less, even though it's publicly traded. And so that has actually been very helpful as we have similar alignment uh, among our two primary groups of shareholders. I think that's fascinating. You know, that the shareholders kind of share the same ethos that you kind of do as a company. That's that's intriguing. I'm wondering about, you know, you mentioned fourth generation business. We have a number of member companies that have family businesses. So succession planning is always something on people's minds. What are you, you know, what are you all doing to think about that next generation of family members? And will is that a consideration? Do you want to continue to sort of pass your leadership down from generation to generation? Yeah, I, I think the uh, it doesn't have to be. I think if you can make it align like that, there's somebody who is interested from a family standpoint, is qualified from a family standpoint, and wants to do it. That's a great scenario. But you really, I think, have to check all three of those boxes because if you don't it's just not setting either the business or the person up for being successful so uh i think um you know it's probably something that the company thought a lot about you know five to ten years ago as don was nearing retirement age and was was looking to figure out what was what was next um it's probably something that we think a little bit less about right now because I'm relatively new in the role at this point in time. And just, you know, hopefully from a, a an age standpoint, as I referenced before, I've got some runway still. Um, but, I, but I think the, I don't think anybody believes it absolutely must be run by a family member. But if you can, as I said, get that alignment on those three things, that, you know, can sometimes be the best possible scenario, but not the only scenario that can work. So you have three young children. Do any of them say, I want to be what you are, dad, you know, or any of um, them? They're kind of young, so. Yeah, I mean, I think they're still trying to figure out what dad does. <laughs> uh, so um, so we're still we're still some, uh, a ways from that. We did make, or no, we didn't make them. They actually are nine-year-old and seven-year-old. There was this Warren Buffett documentary on HBO a year or two ago, and they watched it. And they they came afterwards, they had taken their piggy banks in their room and they dumped them on the floor and they and both of the my two oldest kids said, 
mom, dad, we want to buy index funds. So well, I think they, they've got a little bit of that financial processing that, you know, has, has yeah. made it through. Uh, I think you're planting those seeds pretty <laughs> early. So we'll see what happens. We'll, you see. Know? we'll see. We'll check back in in 15 or 20 years. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I'm wondering, um, clearly, as you talk about the history of the business, it really has grown and changed. And, and it really sounds like substantially over the last like seven to nine years. And so what are your aspirations for, you know, I think sometimes people when they lead want kind of leave some kind of lasting legacy. Is there kind of a vision you have for your leadership and for the company? Is there something you want to do that leaves a lasting legacy? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think of it in terms of trying to build a legacy. I think of it in just trying to do the right thing and make the right decisions for the stakeholders, you know, the family, the shareholders, mm -hmm. uh, on a day in day out basis. And if we do that, you know, we'll have good results and we'll make an impact in the world. Uh, people will make money. Uh, and people will be happy and want to be associated with with what we do. So, so that really is what I try and do. Um, but I really, you know, I, I mentioned this word maybe once or twice already. There is a stewardship aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I view like most CEOs when they take a role in a non-family business, um, don't. I mean, I, I think everybody always would probably say it, but I don't think they think about in wanting to leave it in better a better place for the next person in the same way that uh, people that run family businesses do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's a lot about what I think. I don't know exactly what it'll look like, mm -hmm. but I would be disappointed if I didn't leave it in a better spot for whoever were to take the reins next. So day to day, you don't have this vision like we need to acquire, like I want to grow this segment and we need to acquire X number of new companies to fill that segment. It's it's not that, would you say? No, it's it's uh, it's being opportunistic. Um, you know, we we uh, we bought a company uh, about three and a half years ago, uh, not not too far from where you are. It's in northern Georgia, mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, uh, that is the largest producer of fire retardant wood in the United States. And it's this, you know, really good business, love what they do. It's a needed product in society. But I didn't, you know, we bought that in early 2017. In 2016, I had no idea that we, you know, should be in the fire retardant wood industry. <laughs> so I, I, I think, you know, being too concrete in your in your prescribed plans um, can box you in in a way uh, that I that I think um, can end up being unproductive. Mm -hmm. So you know, we really operate on a on a set of values um, around you know values around what do we think are proper returns on capital we invest, values around the type of people that we want to work with, the types of businesses we want to participate in. And if we find things that hit those values, then then we'll act on it. And it can be in industries we're in or industries that we're not in. Fair. No, thank you. That's that's really interesting. You know, um, you and I talked a little bit before. Um, I think sometimes the best test of a company is how it prevails during a crisis. And so I'm just curious if you could give us an example. And maybe it's COVID, but maybe it's not. You know, what would be an example of in in your during your tenure of the company kind of experiencing a crisis and having to sort yeah. of manage through it? Well, this is a company that has experienced very famous uh, uh, crises. So the I would say the the biggest crises that I have experienced have been COVID oriented. I mean, I remember we in within Kaplan. We have some partnerships with some universities all throughout the world. And in February, we had, you know, dozens of kids from Wuhan that were suddenly stranded and couldn't get back home. And what do you do? And, you know, just thinking about all of those types of things. Yeah. Um, but the company very famously has has had, you know, two crises that have been turned into movies. Uh, 
uh, uh, one being the, the Pentagon Papers, which um, was a movie a few years ago, and then the other being uh, Watergate and what, you know, what was uh, going to happen there. And so, you know, the, the, the thing that I don't know if people who are watching this uh, saw, I have seen either of those movies, but with the, in the papers, the Spielberg movie a few years ago, um, which by the way, it was very surreal for my wife to see her grandmother be represented by Meryl Streep. She was like, I think I should be really excited about this. But, uh, uh, but um, in that movie, they actually, if you, if, I don't know if people have seen it, they remember this, or if you ever watch it, there are, uh, there are a few clips where they're showing the White House and then you're hearing audio, you know, audio from Richard Nixon talking about the company. Those are actual audio tapes of things he said about mm-hmm. we have to go and, you know, the, the most profitable part of the company at that point were these television stations and which have FCC licenses. And, you know, he was talking about we've got to put a lot of pressure on making sure their licenses don't get renewed. Um, you know, we have to uh, uh, really start investigating them. A lot of very deep, uh, deeply disturbing things. And this happened literally at the same time that the company was doing its IPO and, and in the same week. And so uh, Catherine Graham, uh, who was running the business then, uh, really had to determine whether she wanted to publish these leaked papers about the Pentagon's view of how Vietnam was really going. Um, and and she had to do that at the exact same time that the company was about to do its IPO, like literally in, in the days. So uh, that was that was one of the, you know, a really uh, uh, courageous thing to do uh, that I think exemplified the family control. I think if, if you did not have that, I'm not sure I'm not sure most owners and most CEOs would have stood up for their editorial departments in the way that she did. Um, and that really set the, you know, and it was one of those things that actually really set the tone for the newspaper for the next several decades and really kind of sprung it to the big leagues. Uh, and and that that was, you know, handling a crisis well and then um, understanding the risks and figuring out how to go and turn it into something that's really good for for the company in the long run. Wow. Yeah, that those are great examples of crises. <laughs> the company has clearly uh, yeah. navigated successfully. I hope I never have to deal with anything like that. I was just you know? going to say, yeah, I mean, who would ever think that COVID might pale a little bit by comparison, yeah. but nobody would ever want to say that. Can you talk a little bit about what that's meant for your businesses across the board and how you all are um, kind of pivoting. Clearly Kaplan was um, um, affected. Yeah. What about some of your other businesses? Yeah, you know, I I have been very thankful for diversification this year Mm -hmm. because we have have some businesses that actually, uh, by the nature of what they do, they've, they've actually been helped by more of a work from home and remote environment. And then we have some businesses that have been really negatively impacted. Now, on the whole, like I think most people, it, it has been a net negative for our company. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, uh, uh, you know, something that um, obviously there's, there's the life and disruption aspect, but from a financial aspect, it's been a negative thing for our company. Mm-hmm. But we're... You know, we've we've we really over the last few years have encouraged diversification because it just feels like disruption cycles are happening at faster and faster rates, and that's a way to mitigate. Um, and uh, and so, you know, I'll give you an example at Kaplan, which you referenced, Reagan. We are the largest teacher of of in person English language classes in the world, oh, wow. and uh, we uh, that is highly reliant on somebody who's from a non, it was a non-native English speaker going to an English speaking market and doing immersive classes. And then when they leave the immersive classes, everybody else is speaking English. So it is highly reliant on global travel. Now, starting in about April and basically by, or sorry, starting in about February and basically by, by March, you know, that, that went to close to zero. There was no, and there continues to be almost no global travel. Now, 
because of we have other businesses that we're benefiting and we're diversified, um, you know, we're we actually think we might this will be very painful, but we could come out of this better. Uh, because our uh, kind of conservative view of how we manage our company allows us to withstand a really bad period and the rest of the competitive set may not be able to in the same way. Um, so so I, I think there are certainly um, uh, very, very negative pieces to, uh, to this, um, but personally and, and from a company standpoint, um, but I guess the other thing we're trying to figure out is how do we lean in and, and grasp opportunities that, that come out of 2020 as well. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of our members are trying to do the same thing. You know, is there a silver lining in this? Is there a way to pivot the business in such a way that that they can um, try and still thrive? Um, it's hard, you know. It's very hard. I mean, businesses aren't, you know, if, if a business is going to decline by a couple percent a year for five or 10 years, people can adapt and they can manage to that. But I, I am just a firm believer that uh, uh, businesses are not really built for shocks. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and COVID was just such an enormous shock to the system in such a short period of time that there are just, there's just unknown collateral damage that I think we'll find out, you know, both in our economy and in certain businesses, you know, over the coming, you know, year or two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I would agree with you for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, we've sort of hit on it, your company culture, you know, you, um, kind of how you sort of convey a culture, what's your work environment like? It sounds like you have, in terms of how you invest and who you invest in, there's kind of an ethos and you talk about stewarding this company forward, but talk a little bit about like the pension, you know, mm -hmm. that your employees, but can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, how do you instill kind of a positive work culture in yeah. all these various businesses? Yeah. So I think one thing that, that I've learned is you can't have a uniform culture when you have a set of television stations on one end and a, you know, manufacturing or fire retardant wood business on another end, like they just are different people, different, you know, ways that they want to work and interact. So the uniformity in culture is, is basically impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean that there can't be uh, uniformity in ethics. And, and that is something that I think uh, exists throughout you know, all of our businesses. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, we're a big enough company with, you know, I think all of the employees at our businesses were probably somewhere in the 15 to 16,000 employee range. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody's doing something bad on any given day. It's just too big of an absolute number of things where somebody's doing something that they shouldn't. But how we react to that and how people think about the right way of, of operating business is, is really uniform, even if the cultures are different. So we, we do something, um, uh, we do a senior managers meeting uh, uh, every two years where we build, bring the top leaders of each of our businesses together. And one of the things that's so striking is you have uh, different backgrounds uh, in every way, you know, uh, race, gender, geography, uh, you know, you've got people from inside the U.S., outside the U.S., but you get them together and you really uh, see this commonality of, of, you know, how people think. And that's really great because it feels like we are starting to build a culture where we're attracting people and you know, uh, via and partially probably via osmosis, uh, getting people who think in a similar way from kind of an ethics standpoint on how you, one conducts business. Um, and so that that's what I think of when I think of culture more than anything is, you know, uniformity and how people think about what is the right way of conducting business. Yeah, I heard it said one time, it's it's not hiring for aptitude more, it's hiring for attitude. And I think that's kind of what you're saying, like, because you can't you can't teach that. Right. So it sounds like you've got in your disparate businesses, you have people with the same kind of attitude and and approach, you know, mentally to the business, which is great. That's right. 
That's right. I want to give everybody a heads up that's listening to us. Um, I'm going to ask Tim maybe one more question. So I encourage the group to put some questions in the comments field because in a couple minutes, we're going to turn it over to this group to ask some questions. But I did see one that came in really early that said, how are you encouraging, it's a top team, I think leadership team, to address the human stress element in the workforce? Yeah, I'm, I'm open for any suggestions uh, because it's, it's, there's, not a, there, there's not an easy answer here. Uh, and, and I think one of the things, and this gets to the, the topic of, that we were talking about before of businesses aren't built for shock, yeah. and neither are the people that work at them. And so we had you know, a way of working and uh, understanding how people interacted and then suddenly everybody is working from home and you've got some people that that works better for, some people that works worse for, some people have childcare issues. And, and I think first and foremost, um, just being empathetic uh, is, is a really important part of that. Uh, understanding that you know people are going through different things and it might not be obvious, uh, whether it's health or just life stress. Um, and then you know being transparent uh, making sure they understand decisions the company is, is making and why the company is making them. Um, and then starting to build, figure out plans and communicating how can you make it easier, right? You know, we did a very, um, uh, uh, you know, what was a relatively small thing um, that made a huge difference where we gave everybody a stipend to just go and improve their home workstation. Mm -hmm. And and it was just one of those things where it's like, okay, like I, you know, the company is just going to do things for me. Mm -hmm. And and so I, so I think that that's how we're thinking about managing this right now is just make sure that we have empathy, make sure we have transparent and have concrete plans that you can communicate to people about how we're trying to make things better for them. Yeah, thank you. It's not easy. It's definitely no. easy. Um, I'll ask one more question while the, I see we have a couple coming in, but you might want to just talk to the group about your relationship with Wake. I didn't think to mention that, but maybe you could just um, kind of brief the folks that dialed in or are online with us. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, I'm very excited about this uh, over the course of, um, I don't know, Todd, Todd will correct me here if I get this wrong, but probably the last, you know, 15 to 18 months, we've really started to build a relationship with Wake um, through Kaplan. Uh, Kaplan has uh, been in the higher education world. Many people think of Kaplan from a test prep standpoint, but Kaplan has been in the world of high, higher education, both in building tools and educating people uh, for a very, very long time. And, and a couple of years ago, we made a pretty big shift around, look, we, we know what we do uh, is valuable and we do it really well. And why are we just doing it for ourselves? Why don't we figure out how we can partner uh, uh, with universities out there to you know, take this core competency and be able to help them? And so we, we have a, a set of different things that we're, that we're doing with, with Wake now, um, uh, you know, ranging from kind of continuing education uh, uh, to a few other things, which I'm, I'm, I'm slightly hesitant because I don't know, and 100% know exactly what and what, what hasn't has not been announced yet. So I don't want to make no. sure I, I don't get 100% in trouble on, on, on things. But, um, uh, but uh, uh, you know, we're really excited about working with Todd and, and team to really be a strategic partner for, for Wake as Wake is figuring out what are its goals and, and how, you know, the tools that Kaplan has built up are things that we can, can help you, you all achieve. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to be responsible for any kind of, you know, pre-announcement, but I thought it might be interesting because I'm not sure everybody realized that um, Wake is a Kaplan client, so to speak. So that's great. Um, I, I'm going to, I see a couple questions that have come in. So I'm going to, David Steele wants to know how much of a role did the whole family play in the decision to sell the post? Oh, very good question. Uh, well, ultimately, uh, you know, Don ran the company. And so it was, it was his uh, ultimate decision. Um, now, Catherine Weymouth uh, was, is Don's niece, uh, uh, my wife's cousin. She was the publisher of the newspaper at that point in time. 
Uh, and Catherine came to Don, uh, I don't know the exact timeline, but probably somewhere between six and 12 months before the paper was sold and basically said, look, we can keep, we can keep cutting. We can do another round of buyouts. We can shrink the newsroom more and we can keep the, uh, the P and L, you know, to a spot where our, you know, it's, it's okay. We're not, you know, it's not making money, but it's not going to bleed us. We can do that for a few more years, but I don't see the what the long term plan is on that. Um, and then, and she also said, and I'm afraid if we do this for a few more years, we may not like the product that we're putting in. Yeah. Um, and I think you've seen that play out in in other newspaper worlds. Mm -hmm. And and so she she came to Don and said, look, I think we should figure out. Uh, we should really look at figuring out. Is there is there a better place where we can kind of uh, maintain our our view of stewardship of this, and in this case, stewardship might be turning it over to somebody else. And and so I would say it was ultimately Don's decision. McCathrin was running the paper, and you know was very very heavily uh, in, involved in that, and made what I think was I mean a tremendously kind of brave decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, clearly as Print publications, you know, as the digital world grows and grows, print publications, newspapers, print newspapers, it is, it's been a struggle. We've seen that. So it was a brave decision. Thank you for that. I'm curious, um, you mentioned a cousin. I, we didn't talk about, are there other family members involved in the business today? Yeah, so, uh, it, 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 Yes, uh, it sort of has ebbed and flowed at different points in time. Uh, Catherine is on the board of the company um, and has been uh, for the last seven or eight years. Uh, and then my wife, Laura, uh, actually, she started a company called Social Code, which is a marketing uh, agency within the company, and actually grew that um, quite uh, to be a quite successful business. Uh, and so she was running that, and she actually just left that in August. So for the last 10 years or so, she had been uh, running um, a business within the company. Uh, and so, uh, as I mentioned, she recently left. Um, so I think different points in time, people are or are not involved, depending on, you know, where they are in their careers, what the opportunities are. And if it, if it makes sense, somebody, somebody can't be involved just because they want to be involved. Yeah. Um, it, it actually needs to be something that is going to be, you know, a good bet for the company. Yeah, that makes sense. Absolutely. Well, Todd wants to ask, has asked you to share. He said, I'd love to hear about what it's like to have Warren Buffett as your thought partner in analyzing potential acquisitions you're considering. Well, I... You know, at this point in time, since Warren's off the board, I don't unfortunately uh, get that uh, uh, ability. So I'm very jealous of Don because he had that for for decades. Um, but you know, really, I mean, as Don uh, has put it multiple times, you know, he would be looking at something and he would call Warren and he would ask Warren's opinion, and Warren's opinion was usually, you know, the the the, the smartest one that he would hear. So when you uh, when you have somebody whose nickname, justifiably so, has been the oracle uh, that you can call on, uh, you you feel pretty lucky. And I think Don uh, thinks one of the greatest things that that has happened to him in his life was Warren buying shares in the company uh, fifty years ago, or almost fifty years ago. Uh, so so it was a huge advantage to the company over over the course of decades. Absolutely. I don't see, um, I'm going to ask the control room, but it looks like we've answered all the questions that were in the chat. If anybody else has anything, um, Tim, is there anything I didn't ask you that you'd like to share with the group that, um, I haven't thought about? Oh boy. I mean, we've, we've, we've covered a lot of ground here. So I'm, 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 I'm racking my brain. Um, yeah, you know, the, the only the last thing I would I would add is um, one of the things that co companies and I think family businesses can do it more so have the ability to to they have a sort of a special place to be able to do things that other companies sometimes can't and so 
uh, you know, when when Catherine Graham became CEO of the company, it was in 1963, uh, uh, and it was her husband, um, uh, you know, was a manic depressive, and he committed suicide. And she took over for him, you know, basically the, the next day. And there were all these, you know, you can imagine everything that was going on at that time. Um, but what also happened, she, by virtue of doing that, she became the first female CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And uh, uh, so that was something that I think in, in, you know, if it hadn't been a family business, I don't, I don't think that would have happened. Mm-hmm. And and I think that uh, we spend time both wanting to sort of acknowledge the heritage of that. I think if you looked at our our ranks from a gender equity standpoint, you know we're very very good on that front, uh, and that's been a competitive advantage to us over time. But I I think we uh, continue, and I continue to think about what are things that our virtue of being a controlled company and a family company allow us to do to help pull the world forward maybe a little bit faster than it would otherwise. And I think that's a really unique place that family businesses have. Clearly a differential advantage. And I think that is the perfect way for us to conclude And it's about one o'clock. And so I know for those that are taking a lunch break with us, that's a perfect time. I want to just wrap up um, with a couple things. First, Tim, I just want to thank you so much for all that you shared and your candor and transparency. I know that our members and all of those that dialed in today and are with us online um, appreciate that very, very much. Um, I want to also, we can't do this without the companies that sponsor us and our, um, I wanna just name them really quickly, Flow Automotive, First Citizens Bank, bb and now Truist and the Truist Leadership Institute, Dixon Hughes Goodman, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, Kilpatrick Townsend, Wombobon Dixonson, Front Street Capital, The Latitude Group, The Employers Association, Town Bank, Smith Leonard, and Foundation for the Carolinas. That's a really nice lineup of sponsors and we're so grateful to all of them I want to also mention that we have a program coming up, Um, a great segue to how you concluded, Tim. It's Women-Owned Table Talk, and it's a two-part series, Journey to Launch, Marketing Your Business with Podcasts and Vlogs. Um, You can find out more information about these upcoming programs on our newly redesigned website, which is cpb.org wfu.edu. So please look for us there and look for us on Instagram. Um, We are up with the times. Um, Our Instagram is at Center for Private Business. Um, So thank you everybody for participating. Tim, thank you again. Um, We really, really enjoyed this. I'm so grateful to you for your time today. Thank you for having me. This is a wonderful conversation. Thanks again. All right, take care. Bye-bye everybody.